Okay, here we are. So Mark chapter 6, <clears throat> it's kind of where we find ourselves. We've been walking through Mark for the past few months, and uh, we had baptism last week, which is an unbelievable, incredible celebration of life change, and, and really what the gospel of Jesus is about. I think if you were to put it in the kind of one word or one phrase is life change. And that's what we talked about kind of leading up to the end of this chapter in chapter 6. And if you're, so if you're with us, because you may kind of, it's, it's kind of in the middle of a story, right? You know, John, it's, it's one, or excuse me, Mark is just one big story. And so it's, sometimes it's difficult if maybe you miss some weeks and you hop in and we're kind of in the middle of something. Well, this is one of those stories, like if you just, if you don't know the context and what happened before, it's kind of like, what is going on? This is in the, I didn't hear this at VBS, Okay. I, I, they, they skipped this. This was, this was never a theme for church camp, you know what I'm saying? Um, but here we find ourselves coming out of a passage where Jesus has sent out the apostles, remember, two by two. And he says, hey, don't even bring a change of clothes with you. Uh, and, and it's a teaching point for us to no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, Jesus is enough. Jesus is all that we need. And so we get this picture as these guys are sent out. They're trusting their Savior. They're trusting Jesus. They're, they're believing that the message of Jesus is profoundly real. Real. I know for a lot of us in church culture, a lot of us maybe grew up in church. You've been in church your whole life. And, but I think the question is, you evaluate, as Grady was kind of challenging us to do this morning, is when do you believe that the message in the gospel of Jesus is profoundly real? Or again, is he Lord or luck charm? You know what I mean? I think it's something that we continually talk about, continually evaluate where our walk with the Lord is. And this is exactly what Jesus is teaching. That listen, he says, don't even, don't even bring an extra shirt. I, I want you to trust me that in any, any circumstances that I, Jesus, is enough. And so that's kind of kind of where we found ourselves when we picked or last kind of left off and now we're picking back up because we took a week of looking at celebrating baptism and the doctrine of baptism and then we find ourselves here picking back up where we left off. And so something that I want to continue to talk about today involves kind of what that passage earlier on in this chapter goes with. So it all kind of ties together. During this time they were preaching repentance. That's what Jesus said to go out and do. Repentance, turning away from, from sin. But the first thing, before you can turn away from sin in your life, you have to realize that there's sin in your life. And that's the tough part. That's the touchy part. Like, get off me. Don't talk to me. Don't, don't point out my faults. I know my faults. So until we get to that place, there's no sense of us getting to the place of repentance. And so these disciples, they knew <clears throat> Jesus. Obviously, Jesus had informed them that, listen, you're going to go to some places that you're not going to be welcomed. You're going to go to a few houses, and you're going to go and preach the gospel and share the good news, and some people aren't going to think it's good. And remember what Jesus says for them to do? As they're leaving, he says, hey, dust off your shoes and keep going. And so for us, it's going to happen that if, you, if you're in the, the game of proclaiming truth to people, and I hope as a disciple of Christ that you fall into that category, there's going to be moments where you're going to be ridiculed. There's going to be moments where there's going to be people that don't understand, and there's going to be moments where they push back. And what this leads to is us understanding the same response within our culture today. We live in a society that you don't <clears throat> really have to think twice, I don't think, when it comes to what we just read about John, what happened to him, I can't think of a time in my life, specifically in America, that my life has been threatened because I am a Christ follower. My life is threatened because I go to church or preach or share or, you know, shop at Hobby Lobby. It did that. My, my life isn't at risk. And I thank God for that. I really do. But it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder if we were in the same shoes as the disciples, would we still follow Jesus at all costs? I shared this a few weeks ago. I have friends who are church planters in Iraq, like ground zero Iraq. And they're, they're white just like most of us. And so they stick out as a Thor thumb, not because, yes, because they're white, because they're Christians. And their life, and they knew this going in, 
to be missionaries over and church planters in Iraq, that their life may be taken here on this earth because of their faith. And I was like, okay, if I were to put myself in that situation, is Jesus still enough? Like, you're a pastor. No, no, seriously, like, think about it. There's moments where it's like, okay, I I love Jesus with all my heart, but I've never been put, put in that situation. But these disciples, they were all in. They put aside their careers, their, their livelihood, some of their families, to follow Jesus at all costs. And here's the thing. Like, everything in this life <clears throat> has a cost, right? Probably the Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts that you picked up this morning on the way to church. That's why you were late. But we'll, we'll forgive you. But it had a cost. There's nothing in this world that's free, right? The heat that you had in your home last night because it's bitter cold, you had to pay for that. You may not know, but in a few weeks, you're going to get a bill in the mail or an email saying, hey, time's up. you got to pay. Everything in this life has some sort of cost, and we come to the reality of asking if we are willing to live with the cost. Is it worth the cost? And so some of you who are married, you have to count the cost. Yes. I was waiting for somebody who was going to be this brave soul That'd probably be the only amen I get today, but I'll take it, okay? But seriously, I mean, not, it, okay, from an example of me, all right? So most of you know my wife, Samantha. You're like, yeah, she's the better half. I get that, okay? She's my better half. But marrying her had a cost, all right? Not just from a financial standpoint of her Amazon account, you know? You count costs with everything. So you would think it would be really ideal and beneficial for me to marry a girl that her family lives in Nashville. Did I do that? No. Her family lives two and a half hours away in the middle of nowhere. Bad cell phone service, no Wi-Fi. I don't even think they have a red light. And so in order for us to to visit family, which we do frequently, which we love them, in case you're watching. Love you. Thank you. But I have to count the cost because there's time in my life that if I go visit them, it's not an easy task, right? You got to drive quite a bit. And so there's a cost for everything. Every, there's a cost of being a Tennessee football fan. I mean, there's a cost from a, an emotional standpoint, from a financial standpoint. And so what we find in this text with John and Herod, word is getting out of the movement of the gospel. The gospel is being proclaimed. The disciples are doing their job and making more disciples. And these political leaders get word, and they begin to take notice. And most of them don't like it. And so Mark mentions Herod, all right? You may have heard of Herod. He's a a wicked dude, all right? Herod, and let me give you some context, historical, little Bible nerdy, whatever. But Herod the Great is not who we're talking about here. Herod the Great had died... And the Romans did something that really they had never done before. They divided the regions into four divisions, all right? And Herod Antipas, who we're talking about today, was not really a king. Even though Mark kind of calls him a king, he was what they called a tetriarch, all right? So he was in charge of one of the divisions or regions of that country. And so Herod had married the daughter of another king. And then had divorced her so that he could marry Herodias, which was the wife of his half-brother. Again, scandal. This is like full-blown Jerry Springer stuff, you know? If you don't know who Jerry Springer is, he's, he's a theologian from the 90s. Uh, uh, but with John the Baptist, this dude was fearless, right? This fearless John the Baptist had denounce the king and his sins. He calls him out on it. He's preaching truth. He says, hey, that's not, that's not a good idea to marry somebody else's wife. That's never a good idea. And he was sure that John the Baptist, Herod had thought that John the Baptist had come back from the dead. Because what this is essentially in this passage of Mark, this is the flashback. So what happened to John the Baptist where he was killed happened before this situation in this circumstance with the disciples and spreading the gospel. 
And so Herod gets word that this guy is going around preaching and teaching and performing miracles, Jesus. And Herod's first thought is, oh gosh, John has come back from the dead. He has resurrected. So it shifts kind of in this flashback to explain how John the Baptist had been just unjustly arrested and killed and murdered. And so even in this brief account, we, we kind of sense this, there's some tension going on in this story. There, there's tension in the, in the palace for, for Herod. It says that he feared John because he, it says that privately he listened to him preach and was in the, this kind of state of perplexity over what he should do. He's like, I kind of like this guy. I, I don't know if I agree with everything he's saying, but I don't, I don't necessarily want to kill him. And then his queen, Herodias, on the other hand, she hated John. She did not like John. And he, she wanted to kill him. And patiently, she waited for her opportunity, kind of this convenient time, to fulfill her just evil character. And so in Mark chapter 6, I want us to read kind of through it again just to kind of give you some kind of where we're headed and where we're at. And then we'll break this down and kind of what's taking place and what God is trying to teach us through his word. So it says in verse 14, we'll have it on the screen. It says, King Herod heard about it. Remember that, that right before this, all the disciples were spread out. They were sent out. The apostles sharing the gospel, Jesus doing his thing. So it says, King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead, and that's why miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he's Elijah. Still others says he's a prophet, like one of the prophets from long ago. When Herod heard of it, he said, John, the one I beheaded, has been raised? Verse 17, it says, for Herod himself had given orders, this is where the flashback kind of happens, for Herod himself had given orders to arrest John and to chain him in prison on the account of Herodias, his brother's, her brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. John had been telling Herod, this is where he's preaching truth, this is what he didn't like, this is what Herodias didn't like, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias held a grudge against him, him being John, and wanted to kill him. But she couldn't, because Herod had feared John and protected him, knowing he was a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard him, he would be very perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. So let's just stop right there for a second, all right? So obviously this is kind of a scandalous kind of story, and this unbelieving man, Herod, was in a bit of a confused and troubled kind of pickle, all right? Because on one hand, he would imprison this man, and he would hate his message of repentance. And on the other hand, he was strangely attracted to the message of John, or the gospel, and didn't really want to do harm to him. And so that's kind of the setup for what happens next, the whole Game of Thrones is about to go down. Verse 21, an opportune time came on his birthday. So at his birthday party... When Herod gave a banquet for his nobles, military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. And so right here, again, this is just, this is, Herod had a birthday party. And he invited all the big wigs, the, the big names, the head honchos, the power people to his house for a party. And at the end of that banquet, Herod's daughter-in-law dances in front of these men. Dances provocatively, all right? Dances in a way that maybe if you're, if you're caught downtown late at night, there's a few places that you should definitely not go to, all right? Now, this was the scene. This was the scene that was taking place that these people, this, this group of men who by that time probably had a little bit too much to eat and probably way too much to drink. And so his daughter begins to dance. It says in verse 22, when Herodias', Herodias wife, own daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. Now, I, when I read this, I can't imagine, all right? I don't have daughters, but I know people that do, and I feel like this would be tough. This would be tough seeing your daughter dance in front of probably a bunch of nasty, drunk old men. 
But what's even harder to imagine is that the person, it says, who was the most delighted to see his girl dance was Herod. So that gives you some context of how wicked this guy is, how, how lost this guy is. And then it goes on to say, the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. Ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. Verse 23 says, he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask of me, I will give to you, up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, okay, what should I ask for, mom? Mom, mom so he's asked me this. I, can, I have one wish. What, what should I ask for? His head. John the Baptist's head. Verse 25, at once she hurried to the king and said, I want you to give me John the Baptist's head on a platter immediately. Although the king was deeply distressed because of his oaths and the guests, he did not want to refuse her. The king immediately sent out or sent for an executioner and commanded him to bring John's head. So he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. And when John's disciples heard about that, they came and removed his corpse and placed it in a tomb. This is crazy. This is in the Bible. This is, uh, they don't teach this that, that often, you know? Now, what's interesting is this, this promise that he had, because what Herod gave, this promise that he gave, he had no political clout, really. He had no power to really give her really pretty much anything. He, he wasn't a real king, all right? So he couldn't make this choice, so he's acting like he has that power, and this is like Herodian, Herodias' moment. Remember his wife? She's even more wicked. And she seizes the opportunity, seizes the moment where her daughter comes to her and says, hey, what, what should I ask for? You should ask for the head. So picture this scene for me, or with me, I should say. In this scene, there's a couple things that we see. One, we see sex, right? We see power. We see pride. We see murder. And Herod, because in front of his military men and noblemen, although he's somewhat grieved at heart, because, he, again, he doesn't want to necessarily kill John. He doesn't want to be embarrassed, so he actually calls for the head of John. Now, I, I read this, okay? I, I see this kind of tucked away. And how it all kind of flows together. I'm like, this is, this is just interesting how they put it in this, this spot. And, and I begin to ask, like, why is this man, John, <clears throat> essentially being assassinated? Why is he being assassinated? And you begin to think, okay, what has God called John to do? What did he call the disciples to do? And the reason that he was assassinated, because he was faithful. He was faithful to the proclamation of the message of repentance, no matter who it offended. He wasn't worried about being offensive. He wasn't worried about stepping, people, stepping on people's toes because he was on mission. And even as the church, this gives us a picture. I mean, there's, there's a couple topics, there's a couple things that maybe we shouldn't talk about on church because culturally they will cancel you. Culturally they will shut you down or try to shut you up. And listen, that's not what God has called us to. God has given us his word. God has given us his truth. And that truth cannot change. Otherwise, it never was truth to begin with. And so even as a church, when we talk about certain things that are hot topics within the church or just within the culture, we shouldn't worry about being offensive. Because our mission is to preach and proclaim truth regardless of regardless if somebody doesn't agree with us. And I find it interesting on that same very platter that member just probably a few moments before they had meats and all sorts of things that they would have at the party. And a few moments after that, they bring in this, this guy's head and lay it. Unbelievable. This unbelievable scene that comes the head of this righteous, sold out man of God. Because I let my mind grab a hold of this scene. The daughter 
hard to imagine, takes that bloody head off the table and then takes it to her mom. And the disciples come in of this now mutilated body and they lay in the tomb. Because here's the picture. What you have here in this crazy story is the move of the kingdom of God colliding with the darkness of the kingdom of this world. And that collision that takes place is placed on the body of John the Baptist. Now, now I want to get you to think with me, like, what kind, why are these kinds of passages, why is this so important that they wrote this down? Why are they, what are they trying to teach us through this gruesome story? What is it meant to do for you? And I, and I would like you to think with me for a moment that these, these scriptures, this word of God is written so that we would be equipped for every work. Not just equipped to teach our kids and to do lessons and to preach and to go to church camp, but equipped for every. So if you find yourself in a pickle like John, that you wouldn't back down, that you would be equipped for that. This passage is written not just to give you history, which it does. This passage is written to equip you to be what God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. It's like, let me me suggest some things that we ought to take with us. I think this is what the Lord is trying to teach us through this passage. First, you should be warned again and again and again and again of the seductiveness and the destructiveness of sin. We should be reminded of that every single day of our life. Because here's the thing. Here's a couple right here. Power. It was all over this story, right? Power for us, even today, is still intoxicating. It it can distort the desires of your heart. Pride can destroy your life. Pride can destroy your calling. And it builds up this anger because we don't get what we want. And then because of that, you begin to do things that you should never think about doing. So power, secondly, sex as entertainment is dangerous. It's addictive. And listen, sin never leads you to a good good direction. It never does. It may feel good in the moment, but it never leads you in the direction that God has for your life. Sin never results in good things. It always leads to destruction. It always leads to death. And so it is not to be toyed with. So if you have that in your life, and I know that that men and women both, even kids, struggle with porn addictions and looking at things that we shouldn't, and I would say get a hold of that quickly because it will destroy your life. It will destroy your marriage. It will destroy the gift that God was meant to give you in a matter of sex. It will distort the things that God intended for it to be good things in your life. And you want to say, well, I'm not as far like as Herod and Herod. I'm like, I'm okay, I screw up a few times, but like these two, okay, it's a, it's a big, big jump. But my, my thing is, <clears throat> you're not far from it. Gosh, you're, you're not. Like if you, even for a moment, begin to let yourself go, just, that's not that bad. I just did it one time. I just did it two times. It's not that bad. And you continue to go, continue to seek sin, continue to, to not show any repentance. I'm afraid that we've worn down, or we we're worn down by a culture that no longer takes sin seriously. And so the Bible is shockingly honest. It, it puts it in your face so you see it again, so you remember, so you will continuously be warned. And so as the pastor of this, this faith family, like continue to be warned to flee from sin. And the way that you do that, I think that in the most simplest terms is that you pursue God at all costs. And there's a second thing you ought to be remembered. And we touched on this earlier. The gospel is an offense. It, the gospel, the, the true gospel offends people because the gospel causes you to think things about yourself 
that you don't want to think, right? The gospel teaches you that life, here we go, is not about you. Nobody likes to hear that. I don't like to hear that. When I don't get to pick where we go on a date night for a restaurant to eat, Samantha uses this all the time. Life is not about you. So we're going to Applebee's. Eating good in the neighborhood, you know. Life is not about you. Nobody likes to hear that, but that's the truth. That's the truth of the gospel. That's why it's so offensive that you are not at the center of the universe. I am not either, but God is. That you do not have the right to write your own rules and to live however you wish to live. That may sound harsh, I know, but it's the truth the gospel brings. That's the choice that we have to make. That's what it means to follow Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus, is to put aside our agenda, to put aside our rules, to put aside how we think we should live, and to follow Christ at all costs. You see, the gospel puts you in a world that is ruled by an authority, and you're not the authority, but the Lord is, and he's placed boundaries in our lives that he's put into this world through his word, through his promise, through his truth. And, and maybe this is the big profound thing that you need to hear today is that, listen, you don't belong to you. You don't belong to you. And what I mean by that, the, the gospel teaches you that your biggest problem in life exists inside of you, not outside of you. Did you get that? The gospel teaches you that your biggest problem in life exists inside of you, not outside of you. That you have something inside of you apart from grace that is destructive and that will lead to your death. And so the gospel teaches that you can't do anything about it apart from this personal rescue of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for a lot of us, that's a hard message. That's where it gets offensive. That's where we begin to, to, to choose sides. But when you find yourself in the midst of, of choosing Jesus, there's no halfway in, halfway out. It's the same teaching point that Jesus was teaching the disciples when he sent them out. Don't even bring a change of clothes. You have everything you need because you got me. You may feel like you're sent with nothing, but listen, because of me, you're sent with everything. In the same way in our lives, we can't pick and choose what we want. We can't look at this book and say, you know what, I really like that part. The whole eternal life, yes, yeah, sign me up. But you don't want, want me to be prideful? You don't want me to have a love of money? You don't want me to... Have sex before marriage? I don't like that. Listen, church, it's all or nothing. It really is. And I would say, like, don't, don't get mad at me. Don't be offended by me. I am just the messenger. I am just the teacher of the one true gospel. Because here's the thing. Many of us, even though we've embraced the gospel, we've embraced Jesus we still have struggles believing that the gospel is what defines you. Jesus is what defines you. It's kind of like this, this illustration of <clears throat> when someone begins to point out a weakness or a fault in your life or a failure in your life. What happens? What's your response to that? Is it simply this? It's like, oh, you know, thank you. I am a sinner. Yes. Yep. I shouldn't have done that. I need to remind, be reminded of this again and again. I know it's a struggle of mine. Thank you. How, how sweet it is to have people like you in my life that can point out my faults and remind me of my sin and to lead me to the cross of Christ. Anybody? Not me, okay? What do we immediately do? If, and I'm not talking about like they're coming at you. 
But someone that you know, that you love, that you trust says, hey, I'm seeing this tendency in your life and it's not healthy. We immediately go on the defense. Oh, well, you know, it's, it, it just happens. I know I shouldn't do it. I'm trying my best. I'm really busy at work. And, you know, I'm, I, I know I shouldn't be in this relationship. But listen, it just, I, I, just, I don't, I don't want to be alone. I, I don't want this. I don't want that. And so we begin to have all these excuses. But really, our response should be, I know, I understand, and thank you for pointing that out. Let's continue to pursue Christ together. So write that down. Anytime I call you out, simply respond with, you know what, Dave? You're right. Samantha, write that down. Okay. You're right. That's not our initial response. Often, again, our rise is we get a rise from your defense and we argue for your own righteousness sake. That's because the gospel still offends you. When a loving Christ, another loving Christ follower who you have a relationship with that you trust calls out your sin, the reason that you're offended is because you're offended by the gospel. It's hard for you to embrace this ongoing message in our lives. Listen, all of us, we need grace as much today as you did when you first believed. Because listen, you are still in danger to yourself. And, and I'm not saying that like to just beat you up. Like you're the worst. I'm not saying that. But I think it's an understanding that we must have. That we cannot do this life on our own. It was not made for that. It was not meant for that. The reason Christ came is to save you from yourself. You say, well, I'm not that wicked, am I? Yeah, we all are. It's in here. We're all in need of a Savior. And so this passage, what's cool about this passage? Maybe you missed this. Maybe you're kind of putting the, the puzzle pieces together. This, this murder of John the Baptist was really a foreshadow of the murder of Jesus. It was a foreshadow of the cross of Jesus Christ because John the Baptist prepared the way. Remember in, in chapter 1, this is way back, it's like eight months ago. In chapter 1, the way Mark starts out is not the Christmas story. It's not the nativity scene. It's, it's hey, there's this messenger that has come, and he's baptizing people. John the Baptist, we're introduced to him. And we see kind of what he's all about and the calling that, that's on his life. And so this righteous man who would be brought to death, the death of a criminal. If you get your head cut off, that's the death of a criminal. By another leader who knew he was innocent. Remember? Remember Pilate? What did he do when they said, crucify him? He said, I wash my hands. Because he knew. Herod, he knew. It says he even feared John because of how righteous he was. Jesus would not die of his own crimes. John the Baptist didn't die of his own crimes. So there's this foreshadowing of it all coming together. It all points to Jesus. So I want to end with just kind of proposing this question. So in regards to the gospel of Jesus, is it worth the cost? Is it worth the cost? The cost of following Jesus ha has a long list of things that may not line up with your way of thinking or even your way of planning your own life. But the good news is, God being God and who he is, his ways are better than our ways. We just have to get to a point where we understand that, we believe that, and we hold on to that. That no matter what comes, good or bad, God is still good. God is still good. And his plans make no sense to us, and they're not supposed to. Scripture tells us he's the God of peace that surpasses all understanding. So those things that we just don't understand, and you never will, but God is still good. 
God's ways are better than our ways. Is it worth the cost to you? Okay, let, me, let me put it this way. I, I think, and I'm convinced, that the reason it is worth the cost is because Jesus thought you were worth it when he went to the cross. And if Jesus thought you were worth it when he died and he resurrected, then I think it's worth it. And I don't think we live in a culture today. Yeah, sure, we're ridiculed and you can say all these different things of men, but we're here. No, nobody stopped you from being here. And I think if you get down to it, like, that's the problem. <laughs> People, don't, even if there was a cost, they definitely, I'm out. Nope, I'm out. But some of us, can I just be real? Can I just be real for a moment? This is just me being real, okay? Some of us, if it's raining outside, no, nah, I ain't going to church. We have all these excuses stopping us from truly following Jesus. And, and, and my challenge is for you, church, is like, okay, how long is this going to go? Because you can play all these religious games that you want to. But I think Jesus is central. I think Mark is all over it. This entire thing is about us choosing. Okay, you follow Jesus you don't follow Jesus. There's no halfway in the middle. Hey, I like him in Easter. I'm out by summertime. Like either you follow Jesus, that he is worth it no matter what, or he's not. That's the harsh reality of where we are. Because John right here, he had weighed the cost. And the cost was what? It was his life here on earth. And what was he doing? He was simply proclaiming repentance, preaching truth, and it cost him his life. When we follow Jesus, again, we give up ourselves, but what we gain, we gain a righteous God that leads us to hope and a forever joy. So you say, well, I'm giving up a lot, but look at what you're gaining. What you got over here is not that big a deal. What God has for you you will not be able to comprehend how good it is. And so that's my challenge for us today, church. I mean, this is, this is not me, you, me beating you up saying, get it right, get it right. This is like Jesus, the Lord, teaching me like David. Get it right. You with me no matter what? So anything that I say, like, man, he's, he's kind of beating us up today. And the reason, may, the reason that you may feel that way, because the Lord has been beating me up the past two weeks preparing for this message. And so I say all that in love. I say all that like, hey, let's do it together. Let's count the cost, faith family, together. And we make disciples no matter what. We, we've seen of what the cost is, and the cost is worth it, church. We're all done playing religious games. We're all done saying, you know what, I'm just going to have a good attendance record, and that's going to be great at church. No, God is calling you to do something more with your life. He has equipped you to do something more than just have a great attendant record at church. That's not why he went to the cross. He went to the cross so that no matter the circumstance, no matter if you find yourself in prison and this crazy woman wants to chop your head off, even at that instance, God, Christ, is still good. Jesus is enough for you. That's what he wants us to hold on to. And I'm telling you, as a church, if we can grasp that and never let go of that, we'll see life change. You'll begin to move, leave this place equipped, leave this place feeling like you're on mission. And your mission is not to invite people to the rising. Get over that. Your mission, God's mission on your life is to make disciples, to glorify God with your life. In the workplace, in your school, in your dorm room, whatever scenario you want to put yourself in, 
Your purpose, your goal in life is to bring glory to the name of Jesus. So I'm going to ask these guys if they would come up and they would sing that same song that we sang before I got up here. And may this again just be a challenge to you. This song that we sing, that man, that just, I feel like this song's from the Lord because it's this prayer. That all of us, man, if we can get to that place, if it's not your way, God, we don't want it. What a bold prayer. What a bold thing to say. What a bold thing to sing. Even it's even in the wrong key. It's like you're trying, you're singing. And my hope for us today is as, as we respond in worship, man, this is our prayer today. This is our prayer that we would genuinely, honestly, more than anything, follow Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and these guys are going to lead us. And maybe you're sitting here today, you've never made that decision. Maybe you've been on the fence, you've been a skeptic, you've been offended by the gospel for years, you didn't want even want to be here today, but what if the day that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, you know, today's the day. I, I want to follow you today. I, I, I'm tired of playing religious games. I, I, I honestly want to follow you. Scripture tells us if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe that he's alive today, Scripture tells us that you're saved. Saved from what? We're saved from the death and condemnation that honestly all of us deserve. But God sent his very best through Jesus to take away our very worst. That's the picture of the gospel. Do we deserve eternal life, any of us, including myself? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But God chose to send his son on a rescue mission. And it's worth it. So maybe today, simply, you, you pray right there in your seat. You confess, Lord, I know that my life isn't perfect. I know I've been trying to do things my own way. But God, I'm tired of running and I want to go to you. I want to follow you. I, I want to turn away from my sin and destruction. Turn away from myself. And God, I want to turn to you. Let's pray. God, I, in this moment, I just ask for your spirit to move. God, I, there may be some people just wrestling with some stuff. There may be even people in this room that feel offended. But God, I pray through your truth, through your word, that it would go forth and speak for itself, for the truth that it is. And God, you would change their heart. God, that we would have this revelation, we would have this reality and, and know that you counted the cost when you sent your son. So God, I pray that following you, that we've counted the cost and we believe that it's worth it. God, give us a heart to follow you, to worship you, to pursue you like we never have before. God, continue to equip us through your truth and continue to lead our hearts in the direction that you want us to go. God, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing.